bang. It's my love going bang, bang, bang. What are you talking about? Mick Jack and the Rolling Stones are still out there making that paper. <laughs> Mr. Witherspoon Thank is one of the much. funniest man in the world. That's my theme. Get a job. <laughs> Kids of America, please get a damn job. It sounds like you're a father in real life. Oh, yes. Get out of the house. I remind people of their fathers or their granddaddy. And I was looking at the water, and some Asian guy walked up to me, and he said, uh, you remind me of my daddy. I said, oh, oh. John Pops Witherspoon was born on January 27th, 1942, in Detroit, Michigan. He was one of 11 kids, and he grew up very poor. But even though they had a tough upbringing, some of his siblings would turn out to be very successful in life. His sister, Dr. Gertrude Stacks, was the pastor at Shalom Fellowship Church in Detroit, Michigan. He also had a brother named Cato, who was the director of the PBS channel in Detroit. And he had another brother by the name of William, who was a songwriter for Motown. And this would lead John to spend a lot of time around Motown. And he would often play basketball with people like Marvin Gaye and The Temptations. And when he wasn't hanging out at Motown, he would be working at the car plant in Detroit now, this was the late 60s, and this was also the same time that John began to have dreams of becoming a model. He said one day he was working at the car factory and he was on break and seen a magazine with a guy on the front. And John felt like he was more handsome than the dude that was on the magazine cover. So this gave him the motivation to want to become a model. He quit his job working at the car factory and moved to New York City to pursue his dream. But after a few years, he gave up. He said it was a lot more dudes that were handsome and taller, and he knew he just couldn't do it. So he went back to Detroit. And when he got back, he learned that his brother and his wife were taking acting classes. And this kind of got John interested but it wasn't for the comedic sense that he would be known for later in life. When he first got into acting, it was through theater, through Shakespeare. He had me doing Shakespeare. I was tan the fellow up. But it's just nobody in the mind of suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortunes or to take up arms against a sea of trouble and by opposing in there to die, to die, perchance to dream. John loved acting, but during this time, he was more on the serious side but it would be his theater teacher who would somewhat by accident send him on his comedic path in life. His teacher would hold a yearly comedy show. And one year he asked John to write a few jokes and do the show. And John not being a comedian during this time was like, I, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that before. But he was just like, you can do it. You know, you'll come up with something. And according to John, when he got up on stage, he had him laughing, he killed him. And now, John finally knew what he really wanted to do with his life, and that was to become a comedian. And another person who was also performing at this showcase that his theater teacher was having was a musician. And he came to John with the idea of, you know, I seen your show, you funny, you know, I'm good at doing the instruments. We can do a show together and go on the road. And according to John, they did, but they were playing all old folks' homes and it wasn't going nowhere fast. Eventually he gave up on this and decided that he needed to head west to Hollywood to really pursue his dreams. And with only a few hundred bucks to his name, John spent $150 on a 1965 Mustang and headed for Los Angeles, but there was some issues with the vehicle that he bought. It constantly dripped oil and transmission fluid. So every few hundred miles, he would have to pull over and fill both of the fluids up. But he was still determined to get to where he was trying to go. But he made a pit stop in the wrong place. He made a pit stop in Las Vegas. And according to John, he lost all the money he had. The only thing that he did right was he rented out a motel for 30 days 
but he had absolutely no money for the most part. John would call home to Detroit and try to ask family and friends for money to help bail him out, but they all hit him with the flavor Flav. I can't do nothing for you, man. And John said he was just left stuck. And since he barely had any money, he could only scrape up enough to buy a sack of potatoes. And that's where he sat in his hotel room and ate for days, thinking about what his next move was going to be. Damn near starving. But one night, he heard Diana Ross was performing, and he said he had a dollar fifty in his pocket. And he went down to the casino, just kind of threw the money into a slot, just, you know, knowing nothing was really going to happen. But the slot machine started going crazy. Next thing you know, John said he won $7,000. He said he couldn't believe it, like the blessing was unbelievable. And this gave him everything he needed to continue his journey to Hollywood. And once he arrived, he would head to the legendary comedy store owned by Mitzi Shore, the mother of 90s comedy actor, Paulie Shore. Now, according to John, they didn't just put him on stage. He kind of had to work his way up. He would do odd jobs around the comedy store. He would work as a doorman, doing whatever he could to make his way on stage and show his comedic talents. But this was a time when the legends were around and it wasn't uncommon to see people like Robin Williams, followed by Red Fox, and then Richard Pryor all in the same night. And eventually, he worked his way up to being an MC. Now, according to John, a lot of comics don't like the job of being an MC because, you know, they want to be on stage and able to do their material. But he said he knew if he could just slip in some jokes here and there, you know, start getting a reputation and being funny, eventually they would ask him to do a full set. And that plan worked. And Mitzi would ask him to become one of the regular comics at the comedy store. And this would also be the time that he would meet his lifelong friend, David Letterman. And according to John, David Letterman came to Hollywood with his wife, a red pickup truck, and a dog named Bob. That was it. But the two would form a very close bond. And when John wasn't working as a comedian at night, during the day, he would be working at the Gucci store where he would get to meet a lot of different celebrities. And he would also act as a psychiatrist as well. This is when he would start to gather some of that fatherly influence that he would later be known for. He said he would talk to people like Nico Brando, Sammy Davis Jr. He said they would just sit up and talk about life. And throughout the 70s, John would make numerous appearances on TV on shows like The Incredible Hawk, Good Times, What's Happening. He actually was a writer on a short-lived Richard Pryor TV show. Him and Richard Pryor had became cool, but he was battling drug addictions and it kind of derailed the show. But one night in the early 80s, John was performing at the comedy store and none other than Clint Eastwood was in the audience and he liked what he seen from John and he wanted him to be in this film titled Rat Boy. And this movie also had a young Robert Townsend in it, who at this time was an up and coming actor and director. And this was all in 1986. In the very next year, in 1987, he would work with Clint Eastwood again on a movie titled Bird. And he would also work with Robert Townsend on his film debut as a director on a movie he had been working on with Keenan Ivory Wayne's the underground classic Hollywood Shuffle. Send chills down my spine every time I say it. Winky Dinky Doll. Bobby, say it with me. Come on. Winky Dinky Doll. Winky Dinky. Throughout the 80s, John could often be seen on the David Letterman show. But whenever he was on, you can tell it just wasn't a standard interview. You can tell the two definitely had a bond. And they would talk about things like David being the best man at John's wedding or the birth of John's first son, John David Weatherspoon. 
also known as JD. What a cutie. And yes. this, this one is very nice. Yeah. This same. one, I think we can see the resemblance to you. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. This, this is you any morning. <laughs> and David Letterman is his godfather. John told a story of Dave taking out a bond for his son, and it matured over the years and gained enough money to where it was able to put JD through college. And John didn't mind helping people out either. He told a story of being at the comedy store with a young Sam Kennison. And Sam began to speak about how he would love to get on the David Letterman show. And John was just like, I can get you on the David Letterman show. I know Dave. And he got him on the show. And Sam Kennison would go from being an unknown comic to being one of the biggest stars of the 80s. And as the decade of the 80s came to a close and the 90s approached, John continued to work hard on movies like I'm Gonna Get You Sucker, Talking Dirty After Dark with a very young Martin Lawrence. He was in the Five Heartbeats. He played the MC, Wild Rudy. And he would also have a scene still in role on the 1990 movie starring Kid and Play, House Party. But it would be around 92 is when people would really, really take notice of him on a big stage. I'm talking movie executives and people like that because Eddie Murphy had a project going on titled Boomerang, which was already completed. The movie was completely done, but Eddie, he wanted to add something to it and he loved John Witherspoon. So they literally just called up John, was like, hey, we want you for a scene in this movie. And everything that you see in that scene from them greeting each other, sitting down, everything was completely ad-libbed. Pops, he killed it. And the Paramount executives, they fell in love with him. Even though at first they didn't want him in the movie, but Eddie fought for him and it was definitely worth it. You got that right, baby. That's why we got little Junior over there. Bang, 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 oh, bang, 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 bang. The 90s would be the time that the culture would really fall in love with John Weatherspoon and become to know him as Pops, everybody's favorite uncle, grandfather, dad, especially after he played the legendary role of Willie Jones in the 1995 classic film, Friday. Eating up all the food, all the chicken, all the pig feet, all the collard green, all the hog malls. I also in 1995, Pops would connect with Eddie Murphy again on the film Vampire in Brooklyn, which he said was his favorite film to work on. And this would also be around the same time that Pops was chosen by Sean and Marlon Wayans to play the role of their father on their upcoming TV show titled The Wayans Brothers. But it would be an uphill battle just to get the show on the air. Now, initially, The Wayans Brothers TV show was a part of the ABC network, but they didn't want John Weatherspoon to play the role. They actually wanted veteran actor Danny Glover to play the role of Pops. They felt like he would be a better fit, but Sean and Marlon, they fought for Pops to get on the show, and eventually, they end up having to take it to another network. But once the show was able to leave the ABC network and get with the WB, they would finally find their audience and find success and become beloved by fans. And Pops would also be seen on other classic black sitcoms of the 90s, such as Living Single and Martin. And as the decade came to a close, he would revise his role as Willie Jones in the Friday franchise. And then in 2002, they would run it back again with Friday After Next. And by this point, Pops was an icon in the black community and beloved by everyone, 
No matter how small his role in a TV show or a movie was, he always let you know that he was there and you always remembered him. But Pop's next iconic role wouldn't be for his on-screen abilities. It would be voiceover work on an Aaron Magruder created TV show, The Boondocks. I am the stone that the builder refused. I am the visual, the inspiration that made ladies sing the blues. I'm the spark that makes your idea bright. The, the Luther, a full pound burger patty covered in cheese, grilled onion, five strips of bacon, all sandwiched between two donuts, two Krispy Kreme donuts. And doing the voice of granddad would introduce Pops to an even younger generation. And the TV show, The Boondocks, would go from just being a comic strip to still having cultural relevance to this day. And in 2008, John would release his very first comedy album titled 63 Cent. And also that same year, he wanted to go back to his first love, that being stand-up comedy. Now at this point, he was about 67 years old. And some people would say, why go on the road and live the life of a comic at such an advanced age? For Pops, it was for one reason and one reason only. When you're broke, money is, you ain't no talking about love and, and affection. <laughs> That's some bull. <laughs> and in 2012, after multiple false reports that came out saying that his dad had passed away, JD decided that he was going to start social media accounts for his dad to get rid of all of the hoaxes and the rumors that were going on. And during this time, he started a YouTube channel called Cooking for Poor People. Now, if you need some laughter, I highly suggest that you go check it out. One thing about Pops is that he was always working, always on the grind, doing movies, TV shows, or stand-up comedy. But eventually, the grind of the entertainment business started to catch up to him, especially the comedy aspect. He actually went on a D.L. Hughley show and was kind of complaining and somewhat joking about switching agencies because they were working him so much. You, are you with ICM? Now. No, I'm, I'm at UTA now. Yeah. You moved to another place? Yeah. I may move to. They're trying to give me too much work. 40, wow. 45 weeks a year. I say, for yeah, 52 weeks in a year. Door. Now, you're, you're doing uh, stand-up now all the time. Too much. Too much. And Pops would also have an issue on stage in St. Louis. He passed out due to some medical issues. And this prompted his good friend, D.C. Curry, to reach out and ask him what happened. But he said Pops was just like, I mixed my high blood pressure medication with some wine and just had a little reaction, nothing too serious. But DC said he told him like, yeah, man, you can't be doing that, man. You got to be careful. And he said Pops was just like, yeah, you right, man. I got to get rid of this medication, saying it in a kind of joking type of way. But on October 29th, 2019, John Weatherspoon would be found dead in his Sherman Oaks, California home due to a heart attack. His death truly hurt a lot of people because he meant a lot to a lot of people. And even at his funeral, it was filled with love. Pretty much everybody he had worked with came through to show support, to speak highly of him and how great of a man John Witherspoon was. Ice Cube, the Wayne's brothers, and of course, his best friend David Letterman all showed up to pay their final respects. But I'm sure nobody was hurting or missing him more than his family, his wife Angela, his son Alexander, and of course, his son JD, who he seemed to be extremely close to. Oh, Dad. Oh, my. Good God Almighty. <laughs> she about to watch your boy. Come back. It's sad, man. And even though Pops left a whole lot of memories and a whole lot of joy, I can't help but to feel that we still needed more time with Pops, more jokes, more laughter. 
and Pops was quoted as saying, whenever young people ask him for advice, he tells them to chase your dreams, no matter what, just go for it. Very simple advice, but very real advice from a wise man. And we miss you, Pops, and we love you. And John Weatherspoon, he was 77 years old when he died. Rest in peace, Pops.